Mises panel, and you wanted to talk about one of your ideas on habeas data. You're calling it right? Is that your term? You make up habeas oh, data? It's, it's not my term. Um, just I'm in the middle of writing on this, but as far as I understand it, Germany was the first to recognize an autonomy right to image and reputation. Um, their constitutional court or their court of last resort. Um, I, okay. I suppose it was several decades ago. Then the EU kind of caught on with its privacy directive. But then is this, is this related to the uh, is this related to the right to be forgotten and all this stuff? <laughs> I haven't heard of it put that way, but that's a good way to phrase some of the issues. Um, anyway, Latin America developed this independently as a largely as a constitutional writ, although there's some uh, legislative recognition, constitutional recognition, and separately judicial recognition. I think the Philippines for forced disappearances has the strongest um, independent right, I think judicially recognized, um, where habeas data includes this sort of uh, right to go after specific public officials um, and you know recover your reputation or your image or something like that. Um, well, let's talk about it in a second, but let, let me kind of lay some uh, some basic things. Uh, so we were talking, and I said something like, I don't quite understand what you mean by habeas data, if it's your version of it or what's going on in the world. But so I, said, I think it, it, it's the OAS. Oh, hold on a second. And, oh, sorry. Hold sorry. on a second before yeah. we get there. Uh, so yeah. I was just going to say, I said something like, even if it's a fake right, I'm in favor of it. I didn't mean to disparage it. What I meant was, like in political theory and in our view of government, um, like even in – American, say, Lockean, Jeffersonian American political theory, there's yeah. this idea of civil liberties or civil rights versus natural rights, and um, the natural rights are the ones that exist before government, right, or outside government, like the right not to be murdered or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But then there are civil rights like that don't exist absent it's some kind of a society-wide agreement, like the right to vote, for example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it doesn't mean that we disparage those, but they're not the same as natural rights because they can't exist without society or without a government. Uh, and then, then there's more prophylactic type rights, which you, you call them rights, like say the right to be presumed innocent. It's not really a right because if you're actually guilty of a crime, you do deserve to be punished. But we have to attribute a right to you to be presumed procedural. guilty, be you, presumed What would you innocent. call that prophylactic? You call that procedural, Pro right? Prophylactic means sort of like you know a condo. It's preventative, so it's sort of like okay. um, it's not yeah. a real right, but it's a right that we have to have. We have to insist that the government pretend like it's a right, uh, to in a sense to limit the government. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So it's not a natural right or not even a real right, but when you start and then this ties into the American debate over like uh, plenary powers and. The Bill of Rights is limits on the government, the federal government's powers versus the Tenth Amendment sort of look where it's it's a government of enumerated powers. So the way so the way I look at it and the way I think the more original founders looked at it was the Bill of Rights is pretty much superfluous and, and like redundant and really irrelevant. It like the whole way that the rights were protected from federal violation was to just enumerate and limit the powers of the federal government. So they never had yeah. the power, they never had the power to violate rights and ways a b and c so you really don't need to enumerate the rights so the rights view is like you view the government's power as plenary or complete like the states like most states have like the u.s states have so you have to limit what they can do with rights but the federal government is unique in that it only has enumerated powers but anyway the point I'll is there I'll, well go ahead yeah. you go I, i'm I just gonna leave. say that the, 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 i'm just gonna say that the way we view rights is Things that the government shouldn't invade, but one way to stop the government from doing that is you could list the rights or you could just limit the powers of the government. And sometimes you limit the powers of the government by an enumeration of an artificial right, right? Like the like the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, due process, uh, uh, the Sixth Amendment. You know, uh, you have to uh, uh, you have to uh, pre presumption of innocence, that well, kind of stuff. Yeah, due anyway, process go, is go a ahead. good example of your categories to it. Well, I'll. I'll pause there because we could do a separate uh, chat on uh, enumeration and Gibbons v. Ogden and the Commerce Clause, but um, yeah, that's, that's separate, not really that's libertarian. Yeah, it's just uh, U.S. constitutional stuff, and 
and the reason I'm bringing this up is because when I taught computer law about 20 years ago, yeah. which was kind of before internet law, there was a whole developing body of law on what's called like database type stuff. Like, does the government have the right to collect databases of information like surveillance In yeah, yeah, on yeah. its citizens? Um, or is that too dangerous for them to do? So there are there were yeah, various yeah. limitations in the law about what information governments could collect on you. And yeah. I if I'm not wrong, that's probably tied into this habeas data type stuff. Now yeah, yeah, I would yeah. say there's there's no natural right for someone not to have data on you, but when it's in government's hands, we can limit what government does as a precautionary measure to keep them from violating rights, right? Yeah, or from, abu I, from abusing this position they have. I think whether there's a right, a private right for someone not to have data on you is, it kind of begs the question. Um, because, you know, under certain conceptions, you could have a private right to recover a record or a pattern of information that is about your person or, or very central to your autonomy in a way. Well, especially um, especially if the uh, someone like say committed a, a trespass, like say let's say yes, someone broke into yeah. they, they broke into yeah. your house and they stole private information. That exactly happened to me. They they broke into my study and cloned my laptop. These guys who were helping me with Airbnb and they um, they uh, distributed patterns of my personal laptop information to the car accident insurer, uh, to my landlords with whom I had lawful contracts to do what I was doing. And then I think also to universities, um, you know, kind of in mixed with mixed truth and, and false accusations. And um, well, and so people often say, because I don't believe in IP, because I don't think information is ownable, they say, well, yeah. then you can't stop identity theft and th things like that. And like, uh, or you can't, or if someone steals my private manuscript, I can't say it's worth more than a blank manuscript because that would be claiming ownership right and information, which is all confused and wrong. But um, uh, you know, the if you think about it, there's no such thing as identity theft. It's a metaphor, and there's nothing wrong with pretending to be someone else as long as you don't use it in a way to take things that they own. So, I mean, if I steal your all your private information, or if I get access to it, let's say, let's say I get access to your social security number and all that stuff. Yeah. That itself doesn't violate your rights. But if I use that to go to your bank and take your money, that violates your rights because what they're doing is they're taking something you own, your money. Yeah. Um, and, and they're violating a contract with the bank and they're violating the bank's property rules because they're using the bank's property in ways the bank doesn't consent to. So they're doing all kinds of things that are already covered by libertarian theory. Um, you know, in, in their action. It's sort of like if you have a, a house and you leave the door unlocked or even open, it makes it easy for someone to walk in and, and do something in there. But when they, as soon as they walk in your house without permission, they're still committing trespass. So I would view that having your private information and your passwords and all that is like having the key to your house, but it's the use of the key that is the violation, right? And it's like it's the yeah. use of the data. I don't, anyway. know I, I don't know if Habe if I or habeas data would agree with that. You know, I'm called this is pretty new discovery. So uh, the idea that this could be, um, you know, more of a fundamental or co a constitutional writ or a more fundamental autonomy right is pretty new ground for me as well. So, so with I'm that background, what, the, what, yeah, with that background, why don't you just tell me what you mean by habeas data and what kind of what your questions are that we could talk, talk about? So, go yeah, ahead. sure. So, just to clarify the earlier question or the habeas data, as far as I understand it, emerged in Latin America. I think Brazil may have been the first to call it that or enact a legislative remedy. And I think it was kind of for the in the Latin American experience, it was part of Amparo, but evolved a little bit separately, which is re recourse to fundamental rights as a sort of writ, just like habeas corpus in the judiciary, where any individual can go and have a fast, efficient remedy where the the wheels, the machinery of justice starts to turn, saying, "Okay, who violated your rights? Name that well, person." Let, we'll... let me ask a question. Uh, it's yeah. kind of isn't habeas corpus is like a common law type thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, we have it in in the American Constitution. Um, you know, Lincoln's famous for having suspended the writ. Of That's Canada. what I mean. It's it's an American and a common law thing. So, but Brazil yeah, is a yeah. civil law. It's a civil law system. I'm, I'm a little surprised they're using a, a common law term as part of their fundamental law in in a civil law system. Yeah. Well, I think you know. Forgive me for confusing which Latin American country did what and when, but Peru and Paraguay and others have put it in as a constitutional right. Um, 
but what they're doing is they're 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 borrowing common law terminology to to modify their yeah so they're kind of they're blending civil and common law terminology habeas the habeas corpus is of course uh you know the british i think it comes from the magna carta at some point or yeah, it's that's what i mean it's like it's a british common law thing and the, yeah and, but and the brazil is, is a civil law other country. countries um developed habeas corpus a little bit independently there's a polish and a russian version um i didn't yeah i just think so, it's interesting that, that yeah. they're blending these systems here well they're yeah i guess they borrowed the the term which of course comes from latin and of course there's latin america so um there's that why don't, you explain, why don't you explain what habeas corpus is first and then we'll go to habeas data sure so habeas corpus as i would i would call it a constitutional writ or a remedy available in, in a court where you go to the court and you say oh any person actually i believe can go to a court and say such and such person is being held against his or her will um and the court tells the accused jailer or the accused custodian you are presumed to have the body, you know, appear before us and maybe bring the body, show us the body. Yeah, I think it's what habeas, habeas corpus means produce the body, right? So yeah, you body. are presumed to have the body. You have the body. So you, bring, this guy, have the body. bring this guy, bring this guy, bring this guy out of his jail cell where he's hidden yeah, away. Bring, bring him to court. Let's see him, let's, him see him and let's, let's, let's decide what to do with him. So that's habeas corpus. It's a writ. And my friend Anthony Gregory, by the way, he's written a whole book on that on uh, from a libertarian point of view, I think. There was a, there was a, dude in the 70s and 80s or early 90s um i can't his name is escaping me right now cutner i think was okay. trying to get an international recognition of habeas corpus which was really cool because it's one of those fundamental things right if the if the state can take you at any time without having to show why take your person at any time then its power is greatly enlarged so it's a very fundamental check on state power right or even individuals cooperating with the state right who who might want to kidnap someone. So I think that what they did, I forget, I don't know what it's called exactly, but when you appropriate, uh, <laughs> I'm not familiar with all your, your internet identity imagery that's going on. Am I, am I still talking? Yeah, I'm listening. I'm trying right. to get back to my screen. I think they took, they captured some of that. They borrowed some of the meaning from habeas corpus and, and they put it in as a constitutional writ in many countries. So I'd like to take it, you know, assuming in the first instance, it's, it's in that regard that the first, the first question in habeas data is, do you have my, my information, my data um, to the state official who's uh, jailing it, you know, has it in custody with or without your permission, I suppose, because you kind does of it have apply this... only to uh, state actors or to private actors too. We'll take it in its narrowest sense and say it applies only to state actors, public officials, or public registries, manual or or automated. So, okay. in the narrowest so what... possible way, this registry or this official has my my information or information about me. And you know, by invoking habeas data, you're saying that. In some respect, it's without your consent. Why don't you give an example? Um, <laughs> too theoretical. Uh, I guess in these Latin American countries, I think it's hopefully predominantly aimed at the surveillance state. So a political activist is giving speeches, and you know the equivalent of the Secret Service or the FBI is or the NWKD, the Soviet secret police, you know, what have you in Latin America, the general's men are, are recording and, you know, monitoring the whereabouts of an activist, so. So oh, is it sort of like in the US when you ask for your F to see your FBI file, the data they've we, collected? We on? have statutory regimes, um, you know, the European directives are aimed internationally um, at states and they are a bit more, geared toward international law, but of course, freedom of information, many, many countries, including the US have that. I think when we talk about habeas data, although there might be overlap, it's exercisable by the person who, you know, says it's his or her information and not by any person. So to separate them most simply, freedom of information, anyone can ask for what a government agency holds, right? you know, certain information. Whereas habeas data is very focused on the individual going after his or her information. 
when you say his or her, you mean information about them? Because I, I mean, that's in the, in the narrowest sense. So, yes, it narrowest sense, public official, public registry, or, you know, manual ledger, if you will. Um, and the individual only wants to access, narrow sense, access the information that is being held about him or her. Um, you know, and then you have this varying degrees of can I, does the individual have the authority to request that it be corrected, amended, or deleted, right? So the, high, is, the highest level is... is the, why, why would, shit. Sorry, you cut out there. Yeah, hold on a second. We're Sorry. still online. Let me just get back to my Zoom. Um, why, would, why would the in, individual have the information already? Like, why does it... Like, like if it's like, let's say they're collecting data on my, my salary. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, already, already know the so, data on my salary. So I don't need to, I don't need to get data about my salary from the government because well, I already know first, my salary. In the first instance, let's say that it's not the IRS. It's a, it's a statistical bureau. Yeah. Um, and you want to know in the simplest way, one, do they, are they collecting it? Do they have it? Right. So, so you want to know you want to know you want to know what they know about you. You don't want to right. Know, yeah, you might want to know. By the way, yeah. are you sharing it with this with the IRS? Because I just had a three thousand three hundred thousand dollar personal loss this year, and I want to know my audit likelihood or something like that. Okay. You know, I, I don't know. Um, you might want to know one: is it accurate? And two: you know, what are they doing with it? So, in the narrowest sense, you would just be able to confirm. Do they have it right? You have the data. Show it to me. Give me back my own information, or you what don't you know. Give it, wait, what do you mean give it back? You mean they have to expunge it, or they just give you a copy of it? I'm just saying access is the narrowest way. So yeah, they have to give you a copy, right, or some record or some affirmation of what they have and what it. And, and to be clear, so you're researching this for um, for a dissertation or something, or what? Human rights, just a paper for human rights law. But I'm okay. litigating in Australia, so I um. You know, of course, I made the connection. Victoria has a Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities, and in their state law, they incorporate um, predominantly the ICCPR, which has a right to privacy, reputation, honor, and um, privacy in the home. So in my example, someone breaks into your study, clones your laptop, uh, how you exercise a remedy against a public official who's in receipt of this information, um, is interesting where the state domestic law incorporates the international charter and the OAS thinks that the ICCPR principle of privacy protects and incorporates habeas data. So at least the Organization of American States and their principles and opinions about habeas data, they think that it's embedded and contained within the right of privacy, which is they think a right of international law. So I'm trying to invoke it in a foreign state's domestic law, well, at the same time, I have to write a paper about it. So, or I, I propose to write a paper about it. So, what, so what's your what's your really question here, like for, for a libertarian or for point of view? Or for, or for you, or for me. yeah, yeah. So I think our, the conception, the burgeoning conception, if you will, my conception or the new the new school, if you want to call it that, I think that there's room to say that information about me or my private information. Some, some set of that is part of my body, part of my soul, part of my person. I see. Um, and I think there's room to assert a different kind of uh, claim, uh, an autonomy style claim over that information. And I think that that's, it's not tangible, but it is right. scarce. You know, you can't have it without having the individual. Uh, the information can't exist without me existing. And um, there's some room to say it's part of my person and I want it, I want it back, I want it corrected or I want it deleted. And whether you can assert that against a private actor is much more interesting. But for now, ah, uh, that, you know, that's, the that's, a polite, that's a polite way to put it. That <laughs> um, for now, I, we're, we're just assuming that the government is the only person subject to habeas data. The public well, that's, that's why I distinguish between fake rights and real rights and prophylactic yeah. and civil rights. Um, I have no problem myself as a libertarian using this construct as basically uh, as, as a simplified way to limit government right yeah. power. Yeah. I don't think I mean 
but you can probably predict my views. I think I, I totally disagree with yeah yeah with the autonomy idea and saying that you 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 can ever own information at all. Uh, the only argument I think you could make that occurs to me is some kind of causation argument. Like you could say that um, just like free speech is not absolutely unlimited because some acts of speech can cause harm, um, like uh, which some libertarians disagree with, but that's my view. Like you Rothbard can, had a nice free speech um, critique in one of his human rights essays. I think it's from For a New Liberty. I happened across it recently. He said the whole common law U.S. US Supreme Court recognition of uh, the right not to shout fire in a crowded theater is confused because uh, that's actually you've interfered with everyone's right to enjoy their show and with yeah. the, the conditions on which the theater owner gave you access and it's actually a property dispute it's not a free speech issue I think um, that's in his uh, I think that's in the chapter knowledge true and false in the ethics of liberty and I think that, like that. I think the analysis is a little bit lacking because um, it, either in that chapter or another place he argues that um incitement is never um yeah incitement I, is never a, a, a tort and i disagree because incitement yeah. it, i just wouldn't put a bright line on it i mean it depends on the yeah. causal analysis if you incite a mob and look rothbard one time argued that um the way you could decide the issue of like let's suppose someone has to shoot you to save their life and they're compelled or something. He says maybe they'd be – they said – the argument is they'd be justified, and Rothbard says, well, the question is if the victim had a bodyguard, could the bodyguard shoot you first to stop you from <laughs> shooting his client? And the answer is yes, so that kind of proves he has a right not to be shot. You don't have the right to shoot him, uh, and by the same token um, – um, A tort of incitement. Uh, by yeah. the same token, if if if, if, if let's say my, my brother's uh, – uh, being about to be chased by a mob, or the mob is getting whipped up, and there's a guy on the stage whipping the mob up. And if he succeeds, he's going to get the mob to lynch my brother. Could I shoot the guy on the stage before he whips the, the mob up into a frenzy to save my brother's life? And I say, hell yes. So to me, that shows that incitement can be a crime. But anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. So, I mean, you were saying you disagree with an autonomy um, data right. Or well, so right. so what I was well what I was going to say is if someone has enough information about you, again, like I said earlier, identity theft it's, it's itself the is not a crime. It's the key. It's, it's not the, the trespass. It's the use of it. So if someone yeah. uses data, but on the other hand, like let's let's take doxing. If you publish on the internet a lot of private information about someone you dislike, hoping yeah. that someone else will pick up that data and go harm them at their house yeah, yeah, or yeah, something yeah. like that. Uh, I think you could, in some cases, make an argument that you're somewhat causally responsible for what happens. Sort of like yeah, you think a that's a tort, though. You think that's a sort of well, I don't. Um, I don't distinguish torts. I, I think there's only one thing in law, and that's a that's a trespass. That's a violation of yeah, okay. use of someone's resources okay. without their permission. Whether you call it a crime or a tort or yeah. a property trespass, whatever. It's basically the simple using someone's resource without their permission. But let's go um, back to your key example. How did this person get a copy of the key, right? Was it, was it, did I, did I, did I give that person a key and then say, you can no longer come into my house? Is that, are that, is that what we're assuming? No, I actually am not. I think even, okay. if, even if you, even if I gave you a copy of the key, but yeah. I put, I put limits on what you, yeah, can you do said, or, don't, don't come in until you ask me first. I'm going to be or, on vacation. Like I said, like yeah. I said, if you if you don't, what if you don't lock your door at all? There is no key. Or what if I leave the door wide open? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you now, were saying now, the, that the information is is not the crime; it's the key to the door. Well, well, it, and it could be a crime to acquire the information too. It could, but that'd right, be a separate right. crime. That's that'd be a separate I'm, crime. That'd be a separate where I'm going crime. Is if you if you if you break in, well, if if you um, I leave my keys at the courthouse and they they actually just take an image of it, right? I didn't know that I lost my keys. I dropped them, right? And uh, so I go home and it turns out that I find out in some way that an impression has been made of my key. So they all they have is an image of it. Now, I, I tell you, an, an, an interesting, weird application of this, uh, kind of sci-fi, kind of Bitcoin-y would be, let's imagine 
I have a passive scanner and I can scan your brain from across the room without violating Yeah, here we go. Rights. So now we're getting into into the I shot through a common law case before we Go ahead. Go ahead. So Well, so we so if I scan your brain and I get I I get your memories from that. And so now I know your passwords and all this kind of stuff. So if yeah. I use that if I use the password like to open the do, the 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 door on your house and break in, that is itself trespass because I'm using your house without your permission. But if but I you're use the scan is not trespass. No, the scan itself is not trespass. Have it. However, that's, that's if, I, if, yeah. if, if, if I get your, your Bitcoin private key from that, and then I use that to go take your Bitcoin from the network, I would argue that's actually not a violation because, number one, you don't own the Bitcoin, unlike your house, which you do own. So you don't own the Bitcoin, and the taking of the information was not a trespass. So you would have the right to scan people's minds and take their Bitcoin. <laughs> Sorry. Of course, if, if that was possible, they would just change the protocol. So, but Wait, anyway. So are you using this as an example uh, that you don't agree with or that you do that you can? No, that that's scanning... my that's my view. That's my view. Oh, okay. All right. So that's that's a good way to put it, um, especially as we I sent through more versus Regents of University of California, because um, I I just going back to habeas data and a personal autonomy right over pattern information. Um, I think that's very much the question in a t for the gene um for the gene therapy people and um you know even as we get into ai is this instantial version of yourself is it is it yours right this pattern of information that describes you uh so you know this is one of the cases that you come across in ip and constitutional law over whether an individual can exercise a claim over um a treatment derived from its cells and i think well and that, back, and that's that's more complicated I, I mean i would say you don't own yourself in the first place you only own your body um right so, and this, so, is, this is this is apparently they're saying discarded white blood cells but they were unique and they fought leukemia somehow and, um you know he, they went after profits on a you know a kind of breach of confidence fiduciary breach and to um, me, that's that's theory. kind of and uh, that's to me is uninteresting from a libertarian theory point of view because it's just a detail of whatever the contract was, and right, so but, whatever whatever it was determines how you should treat the case. And yeah, it's just, it's just well, not interesting. I, to I, me. I'm saying that habeas data makes it interesting or more interesting once again because if you have this right to this this pattern, um, that you know the court perhaps rightly found that he. He didn't have uh, entitlement to a share of the profits as such. But what if you had the right to request that any information describing your your genetic code or your personal information inside your body be destroyed? Then you would de facto- Again, again hold on, For, from a private or from a state actor? Well, I mean, it's University of California. So keeping it simpler, we can assume a state actor, but I, you know, we could go there to private actors. But if you have the right to say, you have to destroy this information insofar as it's about the inside of my body. Then you would have a, a sort of de facto, you wouldn't have a, a property right as such to the research or the profits, but you would have a bargaining chip. You would have leverage in this process. So they would have to come back to the table and they would have to make a deal with you. Well, you see, like I said, I, I don't mind any prophylactic rights or fake rights that limit what government does. The problem right, right, is when, right. you when, when you state them like a, a, a right like that, yeah. they, take on, they take on a life of their own, and then they're, then they're going to be applied against private companies. Well, um, I, I think that's the interesting question for today is when we take on a life of our own as persons, as human beings, right? do we, do we have – does that come with some rights to the information inside our bodies? about ourselves about our genetic code about it and as in your example scanning of the brain well so, let's go let's go back to what rights are and how they arise i mean let's see where we disagree because to me a right is simply the legally or societally recognized um uh propriety or ability to control a scarce resource and it's really not even the right to control it's the right to just exclude others from controlling it that's it so rights are really the uh, the recognized, legally recognized ability to prevent other people from using a certain scarce resource, your body. And you said you want to frame them in terms of trespass. 
you know it, what I'm so it, it, it'd be trespass to use someone's resource without their permission because the that's what trespass in common law is always actionable per se right yeah, if I'm, you walk I'm, on my I'm, land I'm, I'm generalizing and broadening the con trespass i'm just using to mean a use of resources without someone's permission that's all right right so if there's no harm i mean at least in property law we learned that even if there's no harm you can still action for trespass Correct. I'm, I'm not focusing on harm. I'm focusing on using someone's resource without their without permission. their permission. Yeah. So, if the inside of your brain has a, a pattern of information, we would agree that the pattern of information is infinitely reproducible, and that it's difficult to assert ownership of a of a series of numbers as such. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's it's not scarce. There's no rivalry of benefits to information that's infinitely reproducible per se. So so trust. So trespass, I look at trespass as – so for example, when I'm moving around right now, I'm affect, uh, I have gravitational waves that are going in, – in electromagnetic waves because they, yeah. they go forever. They're going through your body right now, or if, or if I broadcast a radio signal for – a, a th that is perturbing the electrons in your body, but it's not doing it in a way that interferes with your use of your body, um, so it's not trespass because – it's it's a use of your body, but it's not one that interferes with your use of it, right? And because your right is the right to prevent you from anyway. So, but yeah. if if but that's where the law of nuisance comes in. Like, so uh, if I, if I have if I shoot a laser beam at you, that's also electromagnetic energy, but that actually does harm and damage the integrity of your body yeah, or, or your eyes, which, yeah. Yeah. which prevents you from using it as you see fit. So that is a trespass, but uh, but a passive. So I think a passive. Uh, now this is sci-fi. Passive I think brain scan. Yeah, it's fine. Passive brain scan. I think it's I think it's impossible actually, but uh, but uh, if if I can scan the inside. Well, let's take something. Like, let's say we we do develop something with X-ray vision, and so now I can see what women look like naked. Okay. Now, <laughs> Superman. Society, you know the the, four, the fourteen year old fantasy, right? When yeah. you read Superman, yeah. uh, are you violating <laughs> someone's rights by looking at them naked? Can't laugh too to hard. me, to, to me, it's no different than if someone is naked in their house and they leave their window shades open. So they're making it technically, physically possible for someone to observe information. And if they want to stop it, they have to take means to stop that. They have to draw the shades. And in the people society, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, sort of thing. I guess. <laughs> so, I mean, that's using, uh, that's using the metaphor, but that's okay. Yeah. I just uh, don't see that you own data. I mean, I don't know what you mean. I mean, your ownership of you own your body. I believe in the Hoppian kind of view. We, you have a, right. you have a, pr a yeah. property right in your body because you have a better, a better connection to your body because you directly control it. So that's the that's the root argument for self ownership, and then the ownership. Right in other resources is because of the connection between your body or your person and those things by by demonstrated by first use original appropriation or you yeah. or or contract from someone else. So those are like the three principles of libertarianism: is like you own yeah, your body yeah. because you, you have the best connection, and you own other things if you were the first to use it or you got it from an owner by contract. That's it. That's all of libertarianism basically. So I think the brain scan is good, passive brain scan, because it's not um, fraud per se or trespass, trespass per se, although I think there's an argument, there's some gray area there. It could be um, contract breach. It could be contract breach in many situations. Or it could be trespass. I mean, just because it's passive, yeah, I don't know. I, I just think that that's not the only criteria um, well i think let, let's say let's say i x-ray someone they're walking through what they think is a metal detector at, in, at my house and it's really an x-ray scanner i'd say that's trespass because x-rays are harmful right because they could cause cancer and stuff like that so it's actually imposing a harm on someone so i think if you do that without telling someone you're actually committing a type of uh, uh, a battery yeah i, I don't know be... if x-ray is a good example because of the minuteness of the probability of the cancers one in ten thousand or something ridiculous like that um but maybe I would, we have something I would, with a I higher would, probability. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I think even I chose that on purpose because I think it's low yeah. probability, but I think that most. Yeah. So people, it's a minute trespass, right? It's a de minimis. Mm, well, I think it's the, the measure of the damages may be small, but I think that it's uh, a trespass. Most, yeah. people, most people would agree that before you x ray someone, you need their consent. And yeah. If you okay. Don't get yeah, consent, yeah. You know, anyway. So you think the brain scan, a passive brain scan, um, our imaginary passive brain scan has no harm, and the X-ray well, has minute harm. Well, the reason, 
the reason I brought it up is I can't imagine a brain scan that actually works that doesn't do at least as much harm as the x-ray does. So I think actually it's hard to imagine a really passive brain scan. Okay, Musk's satellites for cell phone, for Wi-Fi across the globe, uh, SpaceX satellites, they can, whether or not there's a public-private partnership, they can... They can scan our brains without harm. You know, they can create a top-down 3D map. Well, a better example would be the AI you mentioned. If we have AI, uh, we're again imagining something that I think is almost impossible. But theoretically, an AI could just observe what you do, and, and it could it could come up with some kind of map of how your brain works, and it could generate a model of your brain and predict what you know. So, I, I read a blurb, and this is taking this too far, but that memory is the reason AI is not working right now for innovative for in human innovation to capture sort of novelty or our, our way of solving problems is because we have a very spatial way that we access memory and i didn't fully understand the the article but it's an anal analogous to to a gps system or something like that three three coordinates well um, I, i'm skeptical i'm skeptical of ai ever working it might i think if it works we have to grow it we can't design it but anyway um, well let's assume for a moment that they crack the you know, they crack scanning every single neuron in your brain and, you know, being able to replicate you. I mean, that's, you know, I just scanned you by virtue of this Zoom call and I can clone you and have this conversation with you in my room without you. Well, I think even if you right. can scan someone doesn't mean you can duplicate them. That's a whole different technology too, but- um, But you're saying the uh, scan's not trespass. So well, well, what I'm what I'm imagining is I'm saying assume we have an AI which is almost a godlike intelligence. Theoretically, that AI could could know your memories from a passive observation of you. Like you can just look at what you do, right? And yeah. Okay. Use mathematical. Okay. That wouldn't be trespass. To, yeah. Okay. No, it wouldn't be trespass at no, all. I, I, I think I agree with that. Okay. So you've you've captured something that's personal information about you that you're freely kind of giving out, and that's not trespass. So I, th I think we'd agree there. Or, or God, you just take God. God presumably knows everything, so God knows what the contents of your memory is. God, God's been kind enough not to create multiple versions of, of us that we know of. There may be infinite <laughs> Earths out there. Uh, well, we might have a cause of action in a parallel universe, right? We just have to find a way to assert the claim. No, because because God's our owner. He's God's our owner, so he has a, he has a, he has a He's meta normative. Got sovereign immunity. <laughs> yeah, God is our owner, so uh, we're basically so we're basically sovereign slaves. immunity defense for God. Okay. So well, that's the state the is, the, that's but the, the state idea, is maintaining right? a second version of us in a parallel universe, then we have a cause of action for that. Well, the lo the Lockean idea is that God owns everything, and he. So basically, this whole libertarian sphere we're living in is just a playground or a game set up by God. He lets us pretend like we have freedom with respect to each other inside of His rules, but really we're all slaves to God. All right. So I think we've canvassed the um, whether completely or not. We've canvassed the natural law. Um, aspects pretty we've, we've canvassed them at least so i thought as well that the utilitarian um approach is just it wouldn't be clear from a from a first approach whether habeas data you know varying degrees of habeas data would be uh, utilitarian optimal or not um in a society if you will in an, even in an anarchic society against public or private actors um but I, I think that the, the easier way is to look at it as a stopgap measure that's arisen because of rights violations. And so, as you call it, a civil or prophylactic remedy. I mean, I think that's as it exists now. So I think that that's easy to embrace. Uh, but Well, I mean, if you just take, take the, the whatever the rights are, like in the U.S., to, to ask for uh the FIJA or what uh, not FIJA the, it's okay yeah, what, the, the FOIA yeah. FOIA FOIA yeah, yeah. information act stuff FOI, even yeah. if others uh, even if others can do it I, I assume there's some kind of right to get to know what your FBI file is or something like that I don't th I don't think that we have that in the U.S. because they're going to claim a law enforcement exemption I know I know people request it from time to time and like liber li like I've heard stories that libertarians they request their FBI file and then there's nothing there and they get disappointed that they're not viewed as a threat. <laughs> they're, they're not a threat to the uh, state. Don't, don't they know I'm don't they know I'm dangerous, man? I'm a threat to them. That's that's funny. Um uh, yeah, so but, let's assume that that um US law has a 
a police exemption, law enforcement exemption. And I, th I think that begs the question because in the Latin countries right now, as it's evolving, you would have that right against the FBI. Because um, your, your right to access your personal information comes from a different perspective. Well, again, I, I, so, so I guess I would favor any laws like that. I just think the basis of it is because the state is inherently criminal and anything we can do to limit their power is good. And that's, that's it. It's easy, not, that's the easy way to agree, right? So the, it's the harder not, way. It's, is, not, so. it's not really because you have a right to your information about you because it's part of your autonomy and body. And if you put it that way, the danger is that will become a private right used against private corporations um, or private individuals. That's not um, automatically a bad, though. We have to sort of decide that that's, you know, the slippery slope. You know, we have to sort of agree that that's well, very and bad. I guess, I guess, I guess we could argue about whether it's bad or good on net and all that. But to me, I'm interested in the truth. And do do our rights really extend to information? And I, I just say no. Um, now. Let me just mention one other thing. That's uh, one thing I've tried to do in recent years is you have to be really precise with all these terms because yeah, people, I mean we would have to hammer. And so, out. well, I just mean like so the word property. I try when I'm being precise to say, like if I own a car, I don't say the car is my property. I'd say that uh, I have a property right in the car, so I own the car. But to call the right. So the word property is really just the type of a relationship between you and an object with respect to other people. Um, but we – over time, in casual yeah. use, we say the car is property, and the, the reason I think we do that is because – well, the original word started used because it's the word uh, uh, proprietary. Like it, Shadow or chose, chosen action, thing in action, a bundle of rights. Well, I think what that I mean the word is, chose exists, but it's a, it's a bit abstract or archaic. No, but what I'm trying to get at is I think that the reason that we use the word property as a noun to refer to the thing that you have a property right in is because when we, when we act as humans in the world, we employ scarce resources or means to extend our reach into the world, right? So over, yeah, time, yeah. over time, these means or tools that we gather about us become an extension of ourselves they become a property of ourselves or a characteristic or a feature of ourselves so if i have a if i have a knife or a, a, or, a, or, a, or 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 my clothes those are all resources that we own but they become so bound up with our identity that we call them a property of ourselves and then we start saying well that's my property but we people also use say it as a private net. property to distinguish i know it from... go ahead go ahead well, well, that's I'm another – in, in a way, the word private property is a misnomer because in a sense, property rights are, in, are inherently public because the nature of – the purpose of property rights is to put up publicly visible boundaries so other people can observe and respect your the borders of your property. So in a sense, private – in a sense, property, property rights is an oxymoron. In, in a limited, it should sense. be called it should be called public property in a sense, but yeah, um, yeah, it's just it's just the way these terms have. Well, have, the have, way have, the way the law has evolved in the U.S. with Fourth Amendment and even going into um, to abortion rights without discussing abortion as such, is they they've grounded some rights in privacy, and it only recently occurred to me as we talk about privacy versus private property, I thought we were talking about different things. You know, those are different strains of law, a privacy right grounded in the Fourth Amendment or some penumbras and shadows of the Constitution. It's different, right? They're not talking about a, a property right or or private or private property in the sense that we mean. Um, no, what they you know. what they mean is the right to be to, to have a sphere of conduct that the or or, or, or action sphere of conduct, can. yeah, of non interference by the state. And, and so again, that's the Fourth Amendment. That's why I mentioned earlier. It's a prophylactic right. That's not a real natural right. It's just a way to limit what the government can do to us. But we would say that you know your natural rights begin at your door, or at your the, your castle gate. You know, whichever you choose, or would we not? <laughs> well, I think. We have to be careful when we mix in legal analysis with libertarian analysis. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so libertarian I, analysis, you build the fence, you build the wall, you mix your labor with the scarce resource. You know, it's a public signal. Here's my gate. 
I wouldn't um, say you're I, I would I wouldn't describe it by saying your rights end at your door. I mean that's more of a begin, metaphor. Begin at your or, door. Yeah. I wouldn't say the I mean that implies they have a a location or a starting place. I, I I would just say my rights are the rights to exclude others from using certain identifiable resources according to first ownership uh, original appropriation and contract and self ownership. Yeah, that, those that makes it hard because uh, yeah, and I see why the brand becomes something that can be sort of replicated because um, it's not uh, it's not uh, something that you're using to exclusion in the sense. That well, you can't have you can't scared. have a you it, you can't have conflict over data or information. Um, data can be held. In, conflictability was your was your expression. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Conflictable resources. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or th conflictable things, to be more precise, like conflictable things. A thing in the civil law term of any cognizable object that could be subject of legal rights, um, so, but a, confl a conflictable one only. So let's go back to, or let's start with uh, Ray Vindicatio, the Roman civil law claim. Yeah. Um, you know, give me back my stuff. You took yeah, it. In, 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 in English civil law, it's called revindication, actually, like in Louisiana. Yeah, okay, there you go. So from, from, from that Ray, Ray, Vin, Ray, Ray Vindicatio the Latin. Is the Latin, yeah. yeah. Um, there's another, you know, in there's another common law term, I, I think, but that's the civil law term. Um, Correct. Um, so let's did you just know, take did you, did you know? Did you know that I wrote a, diction, a, a civil law to common law dictionary? That's awesome. No, I didn't. I have, you know, I have that stuff. The importance in there. of Louisiana is only recently uh, felt by the the law student, uh, you know, down the line. But that's pretty cool. I came it, across it, it is it's, it's fascinating it's anecdotal, but I came across some uh, stuff on Novus Actus Interveniens from South Africa, and it's really cool the way that uh, the different um, treatment of the same concepts evolves uh, in the different systems. But I. Civil law is still seems like a bit of an alien when you've grown up in the U.S. system, even as you're exposed to international and other jurisdictions, you still don't really understand what it means because you're you're always wondering um, how can the courts not look at the previous decision or something like that. I don't, I don't know. Um, it still seems like this strange monster. You know, Hoppe, Hoppe has some interesting comments where um, he sort of inadvertently almost he took my side, but like because I've written in. in in favor of the civil law or the Roman law in some ways, like I think the common law is superior in some ways, but the civil law is better in so many ways. Um, this idea uh, where the court knows the law, I forget the Latin, curiat nostri, nos, uh, you know, your, your, curi I don't remember the exact Latin, but. Uh, I don't, I'm not, I can't remember that. I know that there's something called judicial notice in most legal systems where the court can take judicial notice of, yeah. of, 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 of obvious or obvious facts the, like. I think the civil law notion is that when parties are not arguing adversarially, then the court applies the law. The court is the repository of knowledge. They don't need the adversarial argument. And I think that's really uh, shallow in the common law systems is that the court generally would limit itself to the what the parties argue. And if the parties are unsophisticated or poor, then the argument's not very rich. Um, because they can't hire expensive lawyers or they're not, you know, they're not legal dictionaries uh, themselves, right? Yeah, I can't remember that one, but- uh, I'll find you the Latin, it's very simple, curiat use noche or something like that. My, my okay. declension is not as good as it used to be, <laughs> but, but the court applies the law. Um, but, you know, going back to Ray Vindicazio. <laughs> yeah. Um, although I think we should do a separate quick one if you will have time or if we'll be interested on uh, commerce clause and uh, limited powers because Barnett uh, missed the I think he missed part of the his commerce clause analysis on his paper that's already 30 years well, old. Well, I I've been persuaded by Sheldon Richmond um I've been persuaded by Sheldon Richmond that the the um, the interstate commerce clause and other clauses in the constitution were actually way broader than we would like would like them to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Although I don't like to admit it, because I think that in court I would argue for a narrow construction. Uh, but right, because we want, but we don't want to rely on just originalism. That's the well. That's I, the I, I, it's not just that. It's. it's I mean, yeah. I think John has. I'm, I'm increasingly persuaded that the Constitution was evil and centralizing, and it's not the protection of rights which 
stupid libertarians think it is. It's just <laughs> – it I mean the word constitution means to constitute, to make up. The whole purpose was right, to create right. a new, a create new a central new government. government. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, the purpose wasn't to protect rights. It was to – it was to create a new powerful government. Yeah, and they no, they only throw, thought of the Bill of Rights. Uh, it was an afterthought, right? <laughs> they had to throw they had to throw rights in there thing. just just to oh, sell shit, it. Just to, pass this thing. Okay, maybe we should have some rights. <laughs> yeah, just to make it palatable. Uh, oh. and so <laughs> and I'm also persuaded by John Hasness, his myth of the rule of law paper that that a lot of the stuff now his his argument goes mainly to legislation and statutory law. Like it's like it's not as objective as we like to pretend it is. And I think that's correct because Statutory law, and in that I would include the Constitution because it's kind of a statute. Um, it's just kind not natural. Law. It's not natural developed law. It's just it's just the decree of a, a committee of bureaucrats, and it doesn't have an objective meaning all the time. And it's usually a result of compromise, and it's intentionally vague. So there is no objective way to interpret it in many many cases. Um, <laughs> although I would still push for the judges to interpret it. In a, in a liberty direction as much as they so could. We want, we want a bounded activism, right? I always thought as well, originalism is a proxy. Um, Correct. A proxy position, right? What we want is a, a constrained activism that prefers, um, you know, activist readings and at certain key areas. Well, right, right. Like I, I, I've argued in one of my papers that oh, the, the Constitution only has instrumental value. Like we're only in favor of constitutionalism to the extent that it produces liberty. Yeah, but that's yeah, because yeah. Yeah. that's because the, the the government defining the the government limiting aspects of the Constitution, including the enumerated well, power want, structure right. yeah. and the Bill of Rights, those things. Um, uh, I I would say proxy, right? You would say instrument instrumental value. Well, what I mean is, yeah. what I mean is, if we had a Soviet constitution or, or something horrible, we wouldn't want it to be interpreted literally because that it would at be. All. Yeah, it's sort of like the argument, like if you have a government agency, do you want it to be efficient or not? And if it's building the roads, yes, but if it's enforcing the drug war, you want that to be inefficient. So yeah, you yeah, don't, yeah, you yeah. don't. So it depends upon the purpose. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. At hand. All right, so I'm. Still putting that aside and saying re vindicatio versus um, a revindication versus access for data, uh, you know, trespass and data breach. Um, you know, so let, I, saying, I actually felt, I, let me, let, since we're talking about this, I found yeah. my dictionary. Here's the, here's the, here's okay. the definition of revindication, right. at least in, in, in American civil court, most of the law. Yeah, go ahead. So revindication, and by the way, I don't have a common law term here, so I can't. I, I never did find a common law analog. There must be one, but revindication is an innominate, which just means it's not a special type. So it's a real action, which means against real property. Yeah. yeah available yeah. available to the owner for the recovery of a movable thing, and for the yeah. recognition of his ownership. Okay. Now. Now this is perfect because it's very analogous. Movable would include, uh, in, in the civil law, movable would include. Uh, uh, intellectual property because they're they're movable because they're not immovable but they're they're uh they're um they're incorporeal or intangible they're incorporeal um but yeah so an nominate real action so if if the law would classify information as a type of as a type of real thing which it does when it recognizes intellectual property then you could have a revindication available uh, right, so let's take that remedy. Yeah. So we say that that's that's good in libertarian natural reasoning, right? It's sort of like specific performance in a contract, right? You're not claiming money damages. You're you're what you're looking for equitable revindication. Um, what was the contract? What what was the contract that that was breached? Well, that's the thing. You're using trespass. It's it's analogous to specific performance. You're saying you trespass. I don't want money damages. I want back my stuff. I want back. But what, but what was the trespass that was committed to get the information you're trying to get back? Well, I think that's the key. In cases where there was a crime, I think that habeas data allows oh, certainly. us. It allows I would us agree to that. highlight the. It allows us to highlight the relief. So I would totally, us, I would totally agree in that case. But I would agree because it's just the damage that was done was a consequence, a specific type of consequence. Of that's not an trespass. automatic remedy. I mean, that's not that's not an, an encoded remedy, if you will, as far as I can tell. I mean, there might be in RICO or the Computer Fraud and Anti-Crime Act, whatever they're, whatever they are, you know, you might have 
No, it's mandatory. not. It's, it's not automatic in the law. But yeah. if you're talking about what what, it, what libertarianism would would permit, I think that I think that you, there's a broad range of remedies that you have to give the victim of any kind of trespass or, or tort. Right, and here we're saying it's not money damages. It's something else. It's a different species. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I I mean, in my in my long paper on rights on the estoppel thing, I argue that. Um, uh, the victim should should be able to choose among as many options as he can he or his attorneys can imagine which oh that's reasonable. awesome <laughs> um but, because that's the way to that's the way to minimize yeah. harm done to him because he can never undo the crime so pure yeah, restitution yeah, yeah. is impossible so you want to minimize other, the harm yeah. and the, the, other the concept, minimization of the harm go ahead the other concept in fraud is restitutio ad integrum right which Make is uh, whole. restoration to the yeah restoration oh that's without the end but that's impossible. So restitu true restitution is impossible. Yeah, equity desires as much as possible to restore the victim. To and, 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 and the Austrian insight into subjective value means that whatever the victim prefers is the best way to make him as whole as possible. So like I give the example in the case of a, a real crime, like um, – I mean a, a, a violent crime like assault or rape or murder. Um, uh, the victim might prefer to punish the, the aggressor. Or he might prefer to enslave him, or he might prefer to forgive him, or he might prefer to get money from the guy. Like whichever yeah, yeah, yeah. of those, whichever of those remedies he prefers, yeah, the is cause, the one the right lies with the victim. The right, the right should, to, exactly, exactly. Right he should have the right to to get whatever he wants within bounds of proportionality. Yeah. Okay. So jumping around, hopefully not too much. So if the state collecting information is always trespass or a crime. Then we have yeah. we have habeas data on you know we have agreement to habeas data on a different sort of principle that the state is always you know their only means is to expropriate and steal so any time they constitute an agency and it collects information you know it's actionable but you know well there's there's another the, argument you could use you could say that so the state is what we call a standing threat to our liberty sure okay it's always a threat and therefore. You have abuse. the right to know what you have the right to know what they know about you, because simply to minimize simply yeah. simply to minimize the threat. Yeah, I think that's the the more operative way in the, these Latin American uh, countries and the, the evolution of habeas data in that way. Because because from the from the from the anarchist perspective, so you take the legal principle a fortiori a fortiori ration, right, which is like the the, the greater includes the lesser. So if from the anarchist point of view, we have the right to abolish the state because it's a standing threat and it's an actual yeah, 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 it's yeah. an actual aggressor. So if you have the right to abolish the state, yeah, yeah, okay. then you have the right to demand that they at least turn over the data they have that they're going to use to persecute you. Okay. It's yeah. it's a lesser it's a lesser remedy than abolishing the state. And you have the so you have the right to kill the state, so you have the right to do something less. Right. I guess we're taking the I, I hopefully the narrower example where there's been some trespass in order to get data. Well, that makes the well again the the government's always committing trespass by its right. Very so nature. I'm yeah I don't know some something that would meet the private standard of trespass. Yeah, that I would bet. make the case so, even clearer. That would make yeah. the case clearer and the type of remedy clearer. Yeah, I agree so with that too. I think that's you know start with starting with agreement. That's that's the simplest. But when you make a legal analysis like you're trying to do, you know all these all these libertarian arguments are going to fall on deaf ears. You know that. I mean, they're going to want the classical. Framework. Oh yeah, I think I'm just hoping to trace the the origin of the right, and then I want to analogize to the right to know, the right to truth when there's forced disappearance of loved ones. I think at least in the Philippines, habeas data means that as well. So I have this cool example where it encompasses both. Um, you know your right to access your personal information and your right to know where your uncle is. So I, I think I want to focus on you know crime and cover up for crime, and um, those examples that I gave you in the email were uh, misprision of felony, where you know someone committed a felony and you're having you're getting some benefit and you're not you're not spilling the beans. And um, I think there was another one. I mean they use perversion of justice overseas but that's maybe not the best example for present purposes so 
I mean, to take to take a more, a more prosaic example that's a little bit unrelated. I mean, imagine someone um, has kidnapped your daughter, and they've got her hidden away yeah, somewhere. Yeah. yeah. I think in that case, even if even if even if you they had kidnapped her and you recovered her, and then the punishment you could inflict on the guy is limited by balance of proportionality. Like, let's say you could you could do something to him, but you couldn't murder him or yeah. kill him. But if 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 she's if she's still missing, I think you have the right to do anything to the guy to torture him to force him to reveal the information yeah. he has about yeah. where she is because it's an yeah. ongoing crime. I we came it, it's a, a lot of asides, but we came across torture you know freedom from torture and human rights, and I said, well, what about you know, we didn't really analyze the private right for retribution. Um, and I just said it's, a, it's categorically different as well. I don't know if that means that we should permit it in all cases, but. No, so, not in all, but I mean, yeah. it shows, well, it's sort of like, I mean, you know, people, people say that slavery is illegal, but the 13th Amendment didn't abolish slavery. It just, it just, it, it not, said you. Especially you, not for law students. <laughs> no, it said that slavery is still permissible for its punishment for, uh, for crime. Yeah, for crime. Yeah, yeah, and the right. government can, yeah. and the government can make whatever they want to be a crime. So basically, slavery is still. I mean, what if the government? What if the government yeah. said, "Well, they can't say it's a crime to be black because that would theoretically violate the." the yeah, I mean, the, they the, can make a lot the 14th of Fourteenth Amendment. Crime. Yeah, but they could they could make. I mean, they already have. We have slavery because we've outlawed drugs, and people go to jail for violating that. Or if you don't, well, if you yeah, don't show yeah. The, if, if yeah, you don't, so. if you don't, if you don't show up for the, for your draft duty, you know, um, draft the draft is a great is a great one for Thirteenth Amendment because um, they they dodged that in um, I think it was O'Brien, United States versus O'Brien. Um, they dodged the question of the draft being a peacetime draft being constitutional, but you have the Thirteenth Amendment, you know, in more recent history so you a draft post 13th amendment hasn't been looked at well and what about taxation you can go to prison for not paying taxes too so i mean yeah we yeah have, we have, we have, the 13th and, amendment right yeah and by the way yeah. people in prison have to work for for pennies on the dollar so we have we have is that in labor. all cases I, it yeah, just I mean, happened. i'm just saying it happens, yeah, it happens. It, yeah of course yeah you have different and so we we yeah. criticize China for having slave labor, but we have slave labor here. In fact, we have more prisoners, I think, in the U.S. than any other country in the world. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was – we started there on uh, – um, not on slavery. I don't know how we got there, but maybe we got there through slavery. Yeah, I um, I guess that's – oh, maybe it was just crime. So – Well, it's, a, it's an yeah. example about – it's an example of how you can – basically have flexibility and remedies and so i was just pointing out in a bad in a bad example but um slavery is not really illegal <laughs> unfortunately right right yeah but I mean, but, but what i meant was in, in, in a private context you yeah could, private you slavery could do things yeah. To, yeah. so so because you have flexibility in what you can do to an aggressor you could you could do some kind of re re vindication of data Which if includes, they, if, yeah yeah okay so we agree that if there's a a private trespass there might be a private remedy as well and if the public trespass mirrors private trespass then it should be maybe be exist as a remedy um i guess i was just focusing on when the state commits what everyone else would recognize as crimes so when the state commits an otherwise illegal crime uh, according to you know recognized state law uh that would be the coolest yeah. area to show how habeas data uh, might offer relief where existing law wouldn't um and i would i would also say in that case i would even be i would be in favor of your right not only to make them reveal what they know but to destroy it right so deletion is sort of i would say it's the third level i mean unless you also want damages or some other remedy but uh i would say deletion is that third level of you know one access to correction three deletion it's the higher but then, level but then, of but then and that control. and that's what translates that's what translates to the private right to be forgotten where yeah uh, i think i think yeah. they have that in europe where like you can tell google to like remove from their search records some information about you european uh privacy directive or something like that um and you know, I, I'll, I think i'll like, be getting into all this a bit more but which is kind of like we say that for children who have criminal records as children when they reach a certain expansion, age, they have, their, yeah. 
they can have it expunged something yeah like that yeah um contract with the minor is revocable within a certain time of the minor reaching the age of consent right something like that or permanently revocable um yeah that's that's neat um so i guess that brings us to the you know assuming we let's just assume as well arguendo we can ask the state to delete it on let's say terms the state would recognize would be habeas data we'd be in favor of that but then Absolutely. um the fourth level of course is is saying to a private company you know no <laughs> you can't have that um i think that's where we'd have the assuming i'm taking the the devil's advocate the habeas the strong habeas data position then yeah we would disagree um i would say that certain information you know if it was within the private sphere in, even if their trespass was non-invasive and they're not doing anything with it um even if their way of accessing it was non-invasive or you didn't notice it and they're not doing anything with it um that would be the coolest area of disagreement where the millennials following Snowden and Julian Assange, um, you know, and other experiences would probably say that we want to be able to delete our personally identifiable inf information from certain private companies that hold records. Um, you know, maybe well, not from people we're in privity, you know, normal contract with, normal privity of contract with. I mean, that's a little different, right? You know, if you're ordering well, from the supplier, then. You know, you might want to take a look at. Uh, did you read Jeff Dice fairly recent article or speech? Um, I think it was an article on Mises about a month ago. It was about Clarence Thomas and one of his decision, one of his arguments about uh, oh, free speech or something like that. And uh, what Clarence Thomas to, gets wrong about big tech. Exactly, right. and there so Dice is sort of arguing a little contrary to say me and Rothbard and Walter Block that we should have a very legalistic notion of these things, and like like de defamation law is totally illegitimate. He's arguing that well, in today's age with cancel culture, you could be harmed so much by a big tech company relying upon a false rumor about you, you know, or your employer could fire you if, you, if someone just calls you a pedophile or something like that. Maybe we should let the common law courts take that into account and develop a type of defamation type action which yeah, I disagree defamation with, is a defamation is a like, oh you don't i mean that's a good example so you don't think defamation should be actionable per se no then that's a, i think that's black letter libertarian from rothbard and block um, no defamation should be should be um it's not a crime uh because okay all right so that's a good one um so what about these sort of common law crimes like conspiracy against rights in the U.S. or um, tortious interference with a contract? Well, so tortious uh, – conspiracy is a different thing. I think collective action, like I said earlier, I think the – Well, there's, uh, the there's guys, economic conspiracy and criminal conspiracy. I just want to – Well, economic, uh, that's probably problematic in most cases, but yeah. – um, to, to make that illegal, but um, well, tortious interference and economic conspiracy. Let's well, say I mean, I, I, all, all antitrust laws should be abolished. So there's nothing wrong with businessmen conspiring to set prices or whatever. I think there's nothing wrong it, whatsoever yeah, I think with it, that. Right. I. I but if I, I think that's, act, when we talk about defamation and we talk, about, well, I'm analogizing to these things because. But when people conspire or act collectively, so I'll, I'll to, tell you the difference I've come up to with. To induce so, breach of contract, so by a third party, right? So well, party. well, that's a different. When people yeah. conspire collectively to to violate someone's rights, they're all responsible. Contractual rights. No, well, I, no, no, no. I'm uh, for, okay. hold on, hold on. Contract. I'm talking about like uh, you know a mafia, uh, like a bank robbery. Yeah, sorry. So contractual who, expectations versus versus rights. Okay, so no. We'll, so let's just take let's take, let's take a bank robbery. Like you have the yeah, guy that plans yeah. it. You have the getaway car driver. You have the guys that go into the bank with the shotguns. Yeah. yeah. I think all of them are liable. Like I think Hitler was liable for the for the war, and I think Truman was responsible for the bombs dropped on Nagasaki, even though he just gave orders, right? So I think they're all yeah, in a yeah, nexus complicit. of responsibility. Yeah, However, here's, yeah. here's a difference with defamation. So let's say, okay, so let's say I incite a crowd to lynch someone. Then I think, unlike Rothbard, I think I'm potentially liable, but it's because I'm playing a causal role in someone's rights being violated. Like the guy being lynched, yeah. he's he's being murdered. Okay. Yeah. But but if I lie about you and I say you're a pedophile and that causes your employer to fire you, then the 
the, the difference here is that the employer has the right to fire you. They're not violating their rights when they fire you. So the employer, has, the, the yeah. employer has the right to fire you for any reason. Yeah. Uh, no, I would I would say more than per se because but if you direct that communication to the employer, then you're seeking, you know, you're doing tortious breach. You're you're seeking. Oh no no well okay so hold on for a second on that. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm simply no so so under my understanding of a contract, which is Rothbard's. Yeah. I don't I don't even view contract as a set of binding obligations. So really, there's no such thing as breach of contract. Expectations, right? yeah, set of expectations, right? It'd be well, better in contract not, law. It's not that. It's just that. It's impossible to breach a contract because what contract is is just the assignment of title to a, to a resource that you own to someone else. That's all it is. It's a transfer of title. So a contract okay. could just yeah. be seen as a web of these conditional, future-oriented, interconnected, interrelated transfers of title to resources, which people yeah. own. So okay. it's got – so so for example – under the law now, if you have a contract to do something, and if you don't do it, that's called a breach. But then because specific performance is rare, the remedy is just the payment of money. So yeah, you could just yeah. look you could just Primarily. look at it as a contract like I promised to I promise to perform a service and and you transfer payment to me if I do it. So that's one conditional title transfer. And I transfer some money damages to you if I don't do it. So it's just two title transfers. So it's yeah, not a breach. Yeah. So yeah. if I don't if I don't perform the service, it's not a breach of contract. It's just that something happened that was contemplated in the contract that triggered a transfer of ownership of, yeah, of so a resource. This makes employment a bad example, right? At will employment is a bad example for well, employment. so all employment is at will. There's no such thing as non-at will employment because employment just means I agreed to pay you money for performance yeah, of a service. Guaranteed payment and you know. Contracts for terms so, of years, so yeah. non at will employment would just be employment where there's a guaranteed payment. That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I hear you. Um, so it makes framing so 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 there's breach, no such thing as yeah. so there's no such thing as tortious interference with a contract because contract is not a property right really of someone. It, it, contract is just the way people transfer their resources. All right. Um, I guess I really brought these things up as they as they affect information um you know and as well and I'll, I'll, effects, yeah. let, let me give you the best case yeah. i could think of for this and it's when i've argued on intellectual property and i've okay patent and copyright are easy and the obvious ones trademark is the next one down i think trademark law should be abolished for various reasons yeah but the but the fourth one that everyone ignores is trade secret now yeah or, or ndas right right well okay. an nda really it has two functions. It's it's a contract, and you can enforce that with normal principles of contract law. Um, but it also helps to hold on a second. It helps to uh, it helps to bolster uh, uh, a trade secret right. Because if you're making an effort to keep some of the secret, then you can prove you have a trade secret right, and then you can get a court order to try to keep a third party from leaking it. That's the whole point of it, which is why it's unlibertarian. But you could argue in a in a narrow case. Wait, the that, NDA is on libertarian. I just want to be clear about that. Not the NDA. So so okay. so let so Trade let's suppose. Are, yeah. yeah. Well, enforce. It depends on how you enforce the NDA. I mean, yeah. So I would say an NDA is only enforceable um, against the, the third party uh, by the by payment party. of monetary damages. But you could bring in trespass law too. You could say that the employer is in my factory, and yeah. he. I don't permit him access to uh, certain secret data, and if he if he if he breaks those rules and gets the data and then leaks it, he's committed trespass, not just breach of contract, but trespass. And then you yeah, could yeah. you could you could treat him in accordance with being a thief, basically, or a trespasser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But here's here's the point. So let's suppose an, my competitor hires one of my employees and bribes him basically to reveal data he's not supposed to reveal. According to his non-disclosure agreement, so that would be a classical case of in, uh, inducing infr or tortious interference with contract or inducing infringement. Um, the problem, from a libertarian point of view, is that the the, the competitor doesn't have privity of contract. But what you could, if, yeah. if you believe, if you believe that the breach of contract by the employee is a violation of the rights of the of his employer. Then you could make a strained argument that the competitor is 
is inducing him to violate someone's rights. I think that's the rights. key for, tor- for TI, tortious interference, that the competitor has reason to know. Um, there's also an analogy there to when uh, communications are intercepted and the intercepting party or the receiving party knows that it was intercepted illegally. Correct. So although when you have that, when they know that there had to be a break-in or a trespass or a hack yeah, or something like the, that. The pro- the problem with that is then you could argue like that, say, um, if there's a copyrighted image or an image that someone leaked that they shouldn't have leaked or, or information of a book file or a movie, it's on the internet, then it would be a backdoor into IP because you could say, well, third parties can't download this data because they know its source would be tainted, right? Well, or you could- usually they're trying to go after the person who's you know, about to upload the video or about to publish the new the news. No, story. not true. Not when they enforce copyright law. They're trying to. Right, right, right. No, I'm, I'm talking more in my my way, my sense of private. And, data and, and, are, in yeah. that case, I would I would be in favor of uh, an injunction type action to prevent someone from doing that. And the reason is because yeah, I think that's key. Can habeas data be the injunction? So I think, I think if, it's, if it's trespass, it can for sure. If it's a mere contract breach, that's difficult, maybe. Well, okay, that's, um, where, that's where we are. You know, there was there was some crime. It's it's, it's evident that there was some crime. Um, it it's very personal information. Assume it's something that needs that meets that standard, so it has to be like genetic code or email. I don't know. Um, and, and and I would I would, tend, I would I would tend to side with that that right of the victim there. Yeah, uh, the thing the thing is, trade secret law applies to third parties, and that's the difficulty. But if you're talking about the actual, the actual, yeah, I think user, we need to separate also this sort of patent copyright trademark from, you know, this is just me in my house, right? It's just, you know, it's it's not so much about the information being profitable, at, you know, it's more this action for recovery, uh, correction, or. Deletion. Well, and you might you might want to look into something called common law copyright, which is pretty much obsolete now. But that was, by the way, it's not what Rothbard thinks it was in his paper. Uh, he 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 made up something called common law copyright, which doesn't exist. <laughs> common law copyright was a previous right which overall evolved on the common law, and unlike statutes, like copyright is now. And it said that if you have an unpublished manuscript, like in your home or in your desk drawer, and someone takes it. And they're about to go public or publish it. You can stop them from doing that. And to me, that's just you don't need copyright for that. All you need is like trespass. You, yeah, Burglary, you just say, yeah. look, yeah. you committed trespass, and one of my remedies is to prevent you from making the the damage worse. Yeah. So I think that's that's a good way to frame it. Is if we if we have habeas data, and it allows us to pursue remedies for um, things that we gave away voluntarily, then it's problematic. Correct. Um, or it's a, a very strong <laughs> way of viewing autonomy that we've never viewed it before. <laughs> well, another, another yeah. <laughs> may classic case would be, let's suppose you have a priest or a counselor or a doctor or a lawyer and you confide under a fiduciary relationship, yeah. You can buy information to them, yeah. and you have a, a relationship with them where there's yeah. a contract, basically That's contractually fiduciary not supposed to reveal it. Fiduciary fiduciary breach of confidence, yeah. So again, the question is, if they breach that, well, if they breach yeah. it, you could always sue them for money damages. That's for sure. Right, but, but we're it, putting that to one side, yeah. Could you use force to stop them from doing it? Um that's a hairier question. I think it's highly fact specific and nuanced. Yeah, well, but, fiduciary always is, right? So, well, but from yeah. a libertarian point of view, the question is: is the concept of fiduciary responsibility well, the psychiatric exception? Is they think you're about to go harm someone else, right? So, if you're about to go breach someone else's rights, then usually again, that, you know, it doesn't that's, hold up. That's, right? that's positive law, and I, I think yeah. most of that's roughly compatible with libertarian. Yeah, I principles. think so too. You know, you're about to go breach, you're about to go kill someone, so guess what? You're right then. Correct. Um, yeah. Totally agree. So I think that's pretty in agreement with fiduciary stand, more or less. Um, you know, with taxes, there's some ambiguity there, because <laughs> if your CPA is spilling your tax secrets, <laughs> I would say no, if there's the if libertarian that, back around. 
I would say the CPA is now in cahoots with the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, cahoots yeah, yeah. With so the he's conspiring with the this, IRS. He's, this part, he, right for, he, for the he's IRS. part of the state. Yeah, he's part of the state now. <laughs> but um, you know, going back to that, our the the interesting area, or maybe the novel area, is where no one did anything explicitly criminal, but they have this information about you. Um, and this to stretch it the farthest, it's a private party. And you want to pursue an action with no privity of contract and no crime having been committed um, and no breach of contract, then you're in uh, sort of the, the least libertarian area, as you would put it. Um, yeah, I would unless say so. we change our conception in some radical way to include this certain information being part of your, you know, persona your body your right your autonomy and therefore your self-ownership somehow includes certain information especially that's found inside you because then we have a physical metaphor that we can look at so the coolest and by the way case, yeah i, I think i think your argument probably would fly with a lot of mainstream legal perspectives I've, i think i've seen arguments like this um, um well i think it's new school privacy right yeah um, it's just the question is how much of that is compatible or if we reorient our thinking, how much of that can, can fly, you know, now or in the future when we talk about uh, someone dying or, or someone um, having an AI co copy of him or herself, um, you know, how much of that is libertarian or unlibertarian? Um, Maybe, maybe we can wait. Actual... We, maybe we, we can wait for uh, libertarian philosophers in the in the year 20, 2300 to figure this out when it becomes. Yeah, a we, we could. But you know, in this in this going backwards example of Moore versus UOM, I think that my case for today versus UOC, sorry, Regents of University of California. My case for today is that if the if obtaining one's internal organs, one's genetic code, what, what have you, is vitiated through fraud or a breach of a fiduciary relationship. If we put the doctor as um, a pure fiduciary in his role with a patient and he takes the patient's private cells and he develops a treatment for them, if I had a remedy against the information itself to insist on the deletion of the information and its derivatives, um, then I wouldn't need a claim for money damages. Correct. And the, the risk there would be that that argument would then be used to say no one else can use that data too because you own the data. So that'd be the, it'd be like an IP. You'd have this thing. weird, yeah, it'd be analogous to an IP right, but where the information was obtained through trespass or fraud. Yeah, but if you if you restrict it to the person who did it, I wouldn't have too much of a heartburn about right. it. Right, but once but you're if, getting if, to fifth yeah. parties receiving treatment who are then mm -hmm. being cured, I yeah. I think that you know it's just a it's at least a different way to look at Moore versus UOC University of California. Yeah. Um, if he had this habeas right to his own yeah. cells. Um, um Sebastian, I got, I got to go yeah. in a second. Me too. Um, yeah, I I thought this was a good way to close, but um, okay. That's where, that's where I think it gets to be the most um, untrodden, if you will. Well, good luck with it, and good talking to you. And we can talk later if you like. But once yeah, another time. It, um, um, there was uh, some Gibbons v. Ogden commerce stuff. The polite, the meaning of commerce as polite social discourse, or something like that. But it it favors this activist interpretation. We'll talk about that another time, I guess. Okay, man. Uh, we'll hang right. in there, and we'll chat later. Take it easy. Thanks for the catch up. All right. Bye-bye.